my name is Akito, um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about some of the action items that we can um, do to help save uh, insects from uh, global declines. And um, so I realize that many of you probably are not familiar with who I am and where I'm coming from, so I wanted to give a brief introduction about kind of what I do as a scientist and then talk about um, what are these action items that, that I'm going to um, explain. So hold on, let me see if I can next slide here. Um, so I, I'm Japanese and I grew up in Japan and uh, this is just a photo of my sister and I when we were young kids um, growing up there. Um, but just like most kids in Japan, we, um, you know, we go outside and we look at butterflies and moths and, and insects. And that was kind of what, what most kids did and, and still do uh, there. So insects are really part of the, the culture there. And it was in Japan that I really learned a lot about uh, insects and um, their importance. And um, if you go to a department store, uh, for example, in Japan, um, you can find uh, butterfly nets and uh, butterfly you know, cages or inside cages. And also th these exist also in places like 7-Elevens and other places like that. Um, so they're readily available items. And um, uh, they even sell uh, beetle uh, uh, bags of dirt for rearing beetles, for example. And beetles are really, um, really part of the culture there. And you know, just like hamsters are here in the United States, people keep beetles in their homes and kids love them. And it's kind of, uh, you know, they're just pets. So if you zoom, if you look at this, this is a, just a picture that I took at a department store, but these are all these different kinds of beetles that they sell as, as pets. You can zoom in, you can see some of the, the beetles in still cages and they sell like males and females together as a, a pair. And this one sold for 2,400. And 80 yen, which is like 20, 20 bucks or something like that. Um, but, but there's all these different kinds of species. You can, you can grow them and uh, you can breed them and, um, and everybody loves these. So, uh, but in some cases uh, they get really kind of big. Some beetles get very large and the stag beetles are the ones that are really um, kind of prized the most in Japan. And in one case, a, a, a one particular stag beetle sold for an incredible $90,000. And it was apparently, um, bought by a, a corporate Japanese executive that lives in Tokyo. And he wanted to have this beetle to show his clients in his office. And so he had this beetle and it lived for, you know, 10 years or something like that. Um, and that was like the prized thing that he wanted to have. So uh, it's a culture where beetles and other insects are really uh, prized. And insects also appear in other places, like even in video games. This is a kind of an older video game. But um, if you, in, in this video game, um, what happens is you're placed in the middle of, uh, of, a, of an island in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there's a, uh, an, an insect um, a butterfly house there. And something happens and the professor of entomology that runs the place uh, has an, something happens to the facility. And he tells you, the main character, that all the bugs in the in the butterfly house have escaped. So the goal of the game is to run around and catch all the bugs. And you have to uh, try to get the bugs before rival bug collectors come in and try to catch them. Um, and that's how you you play the game. And you, so you have to know stuff about, you know, where do the bugs live and how do you catch them and so forth. Other video games like this one, um, this is also an older one, but there's other ones that are much newer that have the same concept. You go out and you, you look for bugs and you, you like post the pictures online and things like that. Um, this one in particular, you, you try to catch the bugs and when you catch all the bugs, you become a professor of entomology. So this was kind of, you know, my, my dream. I followed this sort of general trend that most kids in Japan want to follow or follow, which is instead of being, you know, an astronaut, wanting to be an astronaut or becoming a firefighter, like many kids in, in the United States, I just kind of followed the trend in Japan to become a professor of entomology. And so that's a quick overview of kind of how I got here. Oh, I want to add, add one more thing. This is really cool. So some companies in Japan also uh, to promote their sales of um, uh, certain uh, things, uh, like for example, this is a Japan Airlines uh, plane company, um, in order to increase their sales of uh, ticket sales, in domestic ticket sales, they decided to paint one of their planes with beetles of insects. Um, and it's covered in these, these characters in this uh, video game called uh, Mushi King. And kids want to take this particular plane so they fly on it and, and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the background where I come from. In terms of the research that I do at the University of Florida, I'm interested in diversity, right? Interested in insect diversity. Uh, there's so many species of bugs out there and uh, we just don't know much about them. And you know, I started out studying butterflies when I was younger in Japan and, and you know, uh, collecting them and rearing them and stuff. Um, but as I grew older, I realized that 
butterflies are great, but moths are even cooler. There are about 10 times as many moths as butterflies, um, about 140,000 species described now, maybe 500,000 are out there. We don't even know how many there are, there's so many. Um, and I like to show this picture in particular because um, most of the, the, the Lepidoptera in this picture are, are moths, they're not butterflies. So um, there are a few butterflies in here, but the point is that many moths are also quite beautiful. So um, please pay attention to moths, they're really great. There's now something called National Moth Week too, which is a one week um, event where we look at moths and we post them online and we talk about them and so, so forth. Um, here's a picture of a really awesome moth. Um, you know, a lot of them just look bizarre. Like, look at this one. Um, it is, uh, it looks like a leaf, rolled up leaf. It's a, it's a illusion the, the moth wing pattern looks like a rolled leaf. And it's, it's an extraordinary species. And there's lots of species actually like this out there. So there's just so many bizarre things about moths. And I, I love butterflies, but I have to say that I, I'm just fascinated by, by moths and their diversity. And there's so much we don't even know, including frass. So frass is the scientific term for poop. Um, or caterpillar poop. And if you start looking at frass, it's extraordinary. Like when you're rearing caterpillars, right? The poop just falls into the bottom of the cage um, and most of us just throw it away. But if you stop and look at the frass, they're actually quite interesting. They have these like, you know, they're barrel shaped a lot of times. They have these like interesting um, uh, structures and stuff on them. And one of my former grad students actually, he's so good at butterfly and moth identification that he'll go out and he'll look at the poop on the, on the ground. Um, of these caterpillar poop and look at the tree and be like, okay, there's a so-and-so species of moth in this tree or butterfly in this tree based on the frass on the ground. So it's actually quite species specific, which is extraordinary as well. And we don't know anything about this, of course, but I find it cool. Um, so I'm interested in, like I said, in moths, interested in what they do at night. We don't really know what they do. You know, we, we, we just see them when they come to lights and that's about it. Um, but we know moths are very important. There's even important pollinators out there um, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, what, what's going on with moths uh, at night is my sort of main focus. And the, the, one of the key questions that we're interested in is um, how do they avoid predators? So one of the main predators uh, that moths have to face is bats. And so bats are eating lots of insects at night and moths are one of their primary diets and moths have to figure out ways to get away from them. And one of the ways that moths get away from bats is by their hearing organs. So they actually have ears. And um, these are structures on the, typically on the side of the body, like on the thorax, the, the little circle there shows where that little structure is. But about 80,000 species of moths have ears or hearing organs on their bodies. So that's more than half of them. There's a lot of them that have these things. And they typically use them for evading bats. And the, the research group that I've been kind of always interested in is, is the hawk moths. And hawk moths, you know, or hummingbird moths, we oftentimes see them um, pollinating or coming to the flowers during the day and they're kind of flying around like hummingbirds are really pretty, but a lot of this stuff happens at night as well. And many flowers only bloom at night and hawk moths are um, really important pollinators of those particular flowers. The, the sort of the greatest example of that is the Madagascar star orchid, right? There's this orchid flower that has this extraordinarily long um, corolla um, and there's this extraordinarily amazing moth that has a proboscis or the tongue that goes all the way into the flower and the, the flower is like two or three feet long or something and it's crazy. But anyway, my point is that um, hawk moths uh, uh, do some really cool things at night uh, and they're very active at night and they also have a hearing organ. And the hearing organ, instead of being on the side of the thorax in hawk moths is actually on the face. And it's not, um, you know, it's, it's actually on the front of the face. So that if this is an SEM uh, photo of the moth from the front and the eye is that big round thing and there's that like big big structure in the, in the middle which is actually the proboscis, the, the coiled um, mouth part. And the, there's a, a, a palp, the structure here labeled S, this, the structure here. And um, there's an air sac in it and the air sac vibrates whenever there's um, ultrasound uh, in the air. And then that is picked up by this other structure here labeled P and that's how the moth hears. So if the palps fall off of the moth or are somehow removed, they, they become deaf, they can't hear anything. So our research really focuses on doing work in the tropics. So we go out to places like um, 
you know, the Amazon jungle and things like that, at least pre-COVID we were, we're not doing that anymore right now. Um, but we would go out and we would set up these lights, right? So we set up UV lights in the forest and it attracts bugs. And we attract these moths and they come to the lights and then we study them. And one of the main questions that we were interested in is, you know, we don't know much about what these moths do. And we know that they're bats out there and we know that they try to get away from them. So do they actually, can they actually hear the bat sonar? So the moths come to the lights and we would pick up some of these moths and we would put them in front of the structure or the setup, I should say, where there's an ultrasonic speaker shown on the right here. There's an ultrasonic microphone and uh, IR lights and a camera. And in this sort of very simplified arena, we would place a moth and um, we would play back bat calls on the ultrasonic speaker just to see how the moth responds to this. And we did this over and over. And, and I, this is a, a, one of my colleagues that is um, that I work with very closely. And he's a really good friend of mine. And he's a bat ecologist at Boise State University. And he and I have been working on this for a long time, these kinds of questions. What do moths do at night? Where are they going? What are they pollinating? You know, what's the conservation of them? You know, these kinds of questions that we're interested in. So anyway, um, we, we did this. This is a, a while ago. So the, the quality of this, um, this video is not that great, but this is a time lapse of what we were doing. We were going to various different countries. We were in like Malaysia and places like that. Uh, we didn't, this is back when I was an assistant professor, just starting as an assistant professor. So I had like no money and I didn't, we couldn't get a hotel with chairs. So we were sitting on the ground on, on the floor of the hotel room um, and stuff like that and doing this research. And we were just trying to figure out where do these moths uh, re respond to bats? You know, um, do, can, do they have that are the hearing organs there for bats and what do they do if they hear the, the, the sonar calls? So we did this over and over again for about like thousands of species. We took the DNA out of them. So my lab also does like DNA research and evolutionary research. Um, but one of the things that we found from this study was that they do produce ultrasound, um, the moths do, um, and they do it with their genitals. So hawk moths genitals make ultrasound. And this is the male genitalia. The body of the moth is pointed to the left. So this is just the tip of the abdomen, sort of taken from the lateral side. The arrows here point to these really weird modified scales. So on the upper left, there's a, a, a an image there that says no organ. That's a typical hawk moth. But these other hawk moths have these weird patches on them where the scales have become these like incredibly interesting shaped uh, objects. And, and what they are uh, is that they, they've actually turned into um, a filing structure. So it's a, if you look at the hawk moth abdomen and zoom in, um, this is kind of what is going on. And if you do this, uh, if you film this in high speed, what you see is the, the, the um, genitals moving back and forth. And actually, sorry, there's, there's audio in this and I don't know, I'm not sure how I could set this up, but anyway, um, it produces this, this noise. It, it sounds like shh, 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 like this kind of sound uh, when the, the moth uh, moves back and forth its abdomen. And that's what they do. And the really cool thing that we found, I should say, before we get into this Luna moth is that um, they actually jam the sonar of the bats. So bats, when they attack, they, um, they, they, they locate a moth, right? And they try to capture it. But as they get close, the moth has a hearing organ so it produces, it hears the sound and it produces sounds themselves, makes a really loud noise. The bat tries to catch the moth, but loses it because it can't figure out where the moth is. It's this large wall of noise. And the bat does this air ball around the moth and, and the moth flies away. So it's a defensive uh, uh, feature that we discovered um, that, that these moths use these ultrasonic structures to produce um, sonar that, or, or uh, ultrasound that jams the bat sonar. So another group of moths that I really love is the Luna moths. These guys are so cool. They're beautiful moths. They're found in the eastern United States. They're not actually found in California and, and the West Coast, unfortunately, but there's lots of other very cool moths that are large uh, in, on the West Coast. Um, and we were really interested in this moth because uh, we would go in the field and we would look at these moths, these Luna moths and relatives. Here's a relative, very beautiful moth. And, you know, what the, the, the big question that, that I had and, and my students had was, what are these tails used for? And we went online and we tried to figure it out, but surprisingly, scientifically, nobody has actually studied the purpose of these tails, these weird sort of squiggly tails. And so we did a very simple experiment. We thought, okay, well, these moths are really cool. They actually don't have hearing organs, so they, they cannot hear. They don't even have mouth parts. They cannot eat. They don't really do anything except fly and mate. So what is their defense? If there's bats out there, they have to do something. So we did this really very simple experiment where we tethered some moths and we, we pitted them to bats just to see what would happen. And the bats almost always would get close to the moth, try to catch it, but it would bite the tail and fly away. 
And what we discovered was that the tail was spinning as the moth is flying and the spinning tail creates an illusion and makes the bat think that that is the target that it wants to attack. So, when, so if you look at this sort of experimentally, if you remove the tails of, of a moth and then of the, of the luna moth and you present it to a bat, they get eaten by bats about 80% of the time. So the tails, um, you know, so, so they, they get eaten. Um, if you keep the, the tails intact and the moth is presented to the bat, only about 30% of the time it's eaten by bats. So the tails function as a defensive mechanism. So it's a, it's a lure away from the main body to have the bats uh, attack that part of the body. Super cool. Um, anyway, that, that's the kind of stuff we do. We're also interested in butterflies too. Why do butterflies have tails? Lots of butterflies, you know, small tail butterflies, for example, have tails. The answer to this is actually in, and it's a visual illusion. So here's an example of a, a Lycaenid butterfly. They have something called a false head. It looks like a head kind of, right? With antennae and legs and stuff. And the red spot kind of looks like the body. All the lines focus on that part. And then the real head's over here on the, on the left. And so when a, a bird or a lizard or something comes along, it will bite the tail portion and then the butterfly flies away. So it's a totally different mechanism that, that, is, um, that moths do. So insects, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that insects do all kinds of really cool stuff. I love moths and I've been interested in moths since I was a kid, but insects are really also very important, right? So they're, um, they're bumblebees, there's uh, honeybees, they're all pollinators, um, they're um, beetles out there, dung beetles that are important for taking care of the, um, you know, getting rid of the the, the waste in our environment. Um, some cool stuff that we know now is like these dung beetles can use uh, the, the position of um, the, the moon and the sun um, to, to figure out how to, where to go. Um, so they use the sky to navigate. Um, and very, very interesting stuff is being discovered. And most people don't realize that, you know, insects are also really important because of some basic things that we love. For example, chocolate. Most people like chocolate. And there's this midge called the chocolate midge. It's a little tiny fly. But if it wasn't for this tiny fly, we wouldn't have any um, chocolate because it is, this is the primary pollinator of, this, of the cocoa plant, cacao plant. Um, this is a photo that was recently taken. Um, and it is a picture of a, uh, a mosquito. And um, most people think of mosquitoes as just being horrible, we, you know, especially here in Florida, people don't like mosquitoes. And, you know, you see these trucks come by and they spray all this mosquito repellent everywhere and, and so forth. And everybody just doesn't like mosquitoes. But this is a photo of a, of a mosquito um, feeding or potentially pollinating the flower of a mango tree. So most people don't know this, but mosquitoes might actually be quite important in pollination. Here's a really cool photo that one of my colleagues took recently, and he studies mosquitoes, and he sent me this picture, and I was just blown away. So this is a picture of um, milkweed, right? And the picture's not that, it's a little bit hard to see, but on the left side, you can see on the tips of these, of the milkweed flower, there's all these mosquitoes all over the place. And so this, um, this plant, of course, is one of the most important host plants for monarchs. Um, and we know that um, pollination is occurring both during the daytime and at night, and potentially the nocturnal pollination is far more important than the bees and butterflies that are coming around. There's a study that actually showed this, um, but we don't even know what the nocturnal pollinator might be. And so there's a possibility that it's maybe it's these flies and moths that are actually really important for milkweed pollination. So there's lots of really cool stuff, and we shouldn't think that most insects are bad just because they, you know, bite you, for example. So, uh, the, so now this is going to kind of go into the kind of the main portion of my talk, which is um, this, uh, this, this paper that we wrote. It's based on the study. Um, it's an opinion piece, actually, it, uh, that, which is part of this large uh, compilation of many different uh, researchers that compiled a, a big um, article, uh, an issue, I should say, uh, on insect declines. So um, the issue of insect declines, or the concept of insect declines, actually started around 2018, uh, when there was this, this New York Times Magazine article that came out, and the title was The Insect Apocalypse is Here. After this article came out, everybody kind of um, started to realize that insects might really be disappearing. And that, that article, the New York Times Magazine article, was based on the top article here, at the, very, the, the one that's shown at the very top here, uh, titled More Than 75 
75% decline over 27 years in total flying insect biomass in protected areas. So this study was done in Europe. And what they found was lots of 70, like three quarters of the bugs had disappeared in 27 years. So people freaked out and scientists started to think, okay, maybe there's lots of declines going on. And lots of other studies have, have appeared since then, all kind of showing the same thing in different parts of the world. There've been some examples of insects increasing, but in general, the overall trend appears to be insects declining. Here's a photo um, that was taken on the left in May 1984 in the same place using the same lights in May 2019. And this is in Guanacaste, Costa Rica. And you can see, you know, this, I like to show this picture because it's very, uh, very telling what is actually happening. And, you know, with my, in my experience too, over the last 20 or 30 years, since I was a kid growing up in Japan, I've seen this kind of thing happen as well. Like when I set up a, a light at my house in Japan, I don't see the same bugs that were there when I was a kid. Uh, there aren't the same butterflies anymore when I was, you know, that used to be there when I was a kid. So this, this, this um, scenario, the situation is happening. And, um, you know, the question becomes, why does this matter? These are just bugs. Most people just say bugs are not important, but bugs are important. Um, well, first of all, there are about, you know, 5 million or more species of insects on earth. So they're, they're the most dominant animal group by far on, on the planet. Um, there's five times as many insects as there are vertebrates and plants combined. So that's five times as many insects as vertebrates and plants combined. That's a lot of, a lot of uh, insects. And insects help humans um, at an annual value, at least in the United States, of about $70 billion. That's a lot of money, right? $70 billion of our economy relies on insects. And uh, that's in the form of pollination and waste removal and all these kinds of things. About 40% of the world insect species may go extinct in a few decades. There are these estimates that have been put out there, and we don't know exactly for sure, but these are pretty alarming and scary kind of numbers if they're really true. And when we think about it, insects really are kind of at the bottom of, or close to the bottom of the trophic level, right? So we have these uh, uh, songbirds that feed on insects, uh, fish feed on insects, all kinds of things rely on, on insects. And, and in the case of songbirds, 95% or so of songbirds rely on insects. So what would happen if insects disappeared? And what would also happen if plants, you know, with the plants, plants need insects for uh, pollination. And, and the problem is that insects are still not on most of these conservation radars. So this is a ICUN list from a couple of years ago, 2019. Um, but uh, what you see on the list are things like birds and mammals, sharks and rays and things like this, amphibians. But where are the insects? There are no insects on here because it's just unfortunate. We just don't know enough about insects because people aren't studying them. There's just too many insects uh, and it's just difficult. Um, so an article came out a few years ago um, about this and what we know and how do we act. And in this study by Forrester et al., Scott Black was an author. Scott is um, part of the uh, Xerces Society. Um, and he's also part of this uh, paper that I'm talking about right now. But um, the Forrester et al. Uh, study talked about uh, there's four different things that we can do to change um, uh, the, the insect decline situation. So one is we need to make changes at the national level, national, state, province, and city levels. So these are higher up um, than uh, changes at the working lands, natural areas, and gardens and homes, sort of at the local scale. So going a little bit more into uh, detail here, the, at the national level, what this means is we can promote restoration policy, reduce pesticides sort of on a, on a large scale and make, make um, regulations on, on those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, at the working lands level, we can do things like conserve beneficial insect biodiversity. We could reward farmers, for example. Farmers obviously need to be, um, de be doing you know, be getting paid and doing their work. Uh, so maybe we can, there's ways to maybe reward them for doing uh, activities that are beneficial towards insects, for example. Natural areas. So we can maximize native floral diversity uh, to understand insect communities. We can, you know, do surveys and things like that to understand what's going, what, what, what's there, uh, create corridors for insects to travel through. And then again, uh, the, the sort of the super local level, which is what you can do in your own yard um, and or in your um, balcony, for example. And so this is what I'm going to talk about today. This, this article is really the one that we published about is really about this. What can we do as individuals? We know bugs are disappearing in the world. We know they're going fast. The world is changing. What can we do? It's a big problem. So I would say there's two main things, um, two categories of action items that we can do. One is to create insect-friendly habitats. And the second is to increase awareness and appreciation for insects. Both are very important um, and both are, are necessary. 
So the first one is creating insect-friendly habitats. And one of the things that we can do immediately is convert part of your yard or um, lawn, spe specifically lawn, I would say, um, into a natural habitat. Or if you don't have um, a lawn, you can, if you have a little uh, balcony or something, you can put natural habitat or natural plants and things like that into those areas. Um, but if you do have a lawn, um, I we advocate in the study to convert some of it to a natural habitat. By that meaning, you just let it go. You don't mow. We have this um, image um, and, and belief that you know mowed lawns are are the, the you know pristine and beautiful, but it's a monoculture and it's actually not good for plants and animals at all. And so, if you do something like this, where you can you mow in this picture, you can see that the paths are mowed, but the areas around it are not. You can actually do a lot for the environment uh, in your backyard. And if if everybody uh, in the United States did something like this, where they converted even just ten percent. Of your, of your lawn into just natural habitat where you just didn't mow, you don't have to pay for it or anything, you just let it go, um, it would um, conserve and maybe create up to about 40 million acres of um, natural space for insects to survive in. Um, and then the other, another thing is to grow native plants. So it's really important to um, include native plants in your yards and your gardens and also your patios and so forth. Um, and the best place to find out about this, this is at a local scale. So you, you need to go, um, the best place to, to find out is through um, conservation organizations like the Xerces Society. You can go to your local native um, plant society or your nursery and get information about which species of plants are native. And native plants bring in native insects and native uh, birds and other things too. So they really are the best uh, to, to, if you are to plant. Uh, the third one's kind of obvious, but is to reduce pesticide and herbicide use in the garden and your home. Um, these toxins tend to, um, are oftentimes not targeted specifically for one organism, and they will uh, have a great impact on many other organisms in that environment. And we talk about this a lot in the, in the article, you can find out more, but there's many ways you can actually prevent this, the, the use of it, and also prevent your, or the, the problematic insects that, or pests that are in your garden. Um, number four is is really important, and I guess you know I talked a lot about moths earlier, and you know what are moths doing at night, and what why I love moths and so forth. But um, one of the big problems to to the moth um, behavior uh, the, and, and what they're doing at night is that there are lights now everywhere, and so we know that the world is increasing in light brightness by about two percent every year. Um, this is really alarming, and there are no place there are very few places now in the world where it's completely dark. And so what we can do is we need to uh, change this by either take, turning off your lights at night. A lot of countries in Europe have these um, automatic, you know, timed lights that go off at night, or you can shift the light to um, a more yellow or red spectrum. A lot of uh, countries are doing that as well, like public lights and so forth, and cities in Europe are all now becoming yellow. Uh, we haven't done that all here, uh, much at all in the United States yet, um, but we need to get away from the ultraviolet light range. So the UV range is where the insects are most attracted to. If you shift your light spectrum to the more red light spectrum, then it can actually, you can actually still have light, but not attract insects and cause problems. Uh, number five is to reduce the use of soaps and sealants when washing your car and home. Um, these toxins contain lots of, or these soaps and stuff contain lots of toxins. And uh, we often don't think about it, but the runoff goes right into the, to the aquatic systems nearby and aquatic streams and so forth. And what happens is that causes problems in those insects. And lots of scientific studies have now shown that it causes problems in development of the insects and so forth. Um, so what do you do? You should, uh, if you have to wash your car, instead of washing it with toxic chemicals, you should either use non-toxic chemicals or go, go to, um, uh, you know, a public um, car wash where they collect the water and uh, they filter it. Lots of car washes are now starting to do that. Um, and I mean, here in Florida, for example, one of the things that I noticed when I got here uh, about eight, nine years ago, I bought a home and it was very close to a stream. And I remember in March, and here in Florida, the, the fireflies come out in March, but the backyard was full of fireflies. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm so happy I bought this house. But then like two years later, they were just gone and nobody knew what actually happened to the fireflies. But it turns out the recent studies are now like surveys in the local areas are showing that it's because these toxins are being run off. The runoff is going into the water and that is what is causing the problems. The insects are disappearing, but insects do come back. So if we change our behavior and change these things, lots of insects will come back. Um, so we do need to 
start really doing those kinds of things. Um, the number number six is kind of moving now into the increasing the awareness and appreciation of insects category. So how, um, so one of the things that I think we really need to do is counter the negative perception of insects. And so we look at these bugs here, there's four insects here um, on this, this image, um, but oftentimes when we think of insects, we don't think of them as being beautiful, but we think of them as being these creepy crawly things. At least the majority of people that I have met the general public, I would say, thinks of bugs as being negative. And the problem is it comes from the media. It comes from our culture and um, you know, movies and things like this that you know, presents insects as these really scary or gross things. When in reality, most insects are not. They're actually quite fascinating and, and incredible and important. So this is a problem. So kids aren't getting the information correct and people aren't. And then that is causing this negative perception. And so what I tell people um, that I think is most important is to um, remember some of the reasons why insects are important. And what I always kind of um, advocate for is what I call the five Ps. And this is how insects help humans. So insects help humans because of the five Ps. They are pollinators, prey, physical decomposers, you know, like breaking down um, uh, waste materials, progress. So uh, progress in science, technology, and other resources like silk production, for example, silk is produced from, from insects. Um, drones are designed off of insects. Uh, all kinds of stuff now, you know, visual like lenses, camera lenses and stuff, you know, built off of um, dragonfly eyes and things like this. So there's lots of different ways that insects are helping our, our world and, and the progress in science and technology, and also pleasure. Bugs are just awesome. Um, and uh, insects also, well, I just mentioned this before, but you know they help us at an annual value of seventy billion dollars. So if you're on an airplane ever again, you know after COVID, um, we can, you know, when you run into somebody and people are, you know, they're they're asking you why is it, are insects important, you can always say that they help, you know, our economy by seventy billion dollars. And again, forty percent of the world's insects might disappear in the next few decades. So this is why it's important. Um, and like I said, insects are just beautiful. It, they, they, they can make people happy just by looking at them. They're interesting. And um, they're just cool to watch, you know, when they fly. I, I love these, these moths with the tails. It's just, they're just beautiful, you know? And, and so we, we should learn from them and um, appreciate uh, what they are. Um, and then number seven is become an educator, ambassador, and an advocate for conservation. And so this is something that you can do um, at the local community level. Uh, there's lots of community science opportunities um, where you go out and you look at um, the, the insects out there uh, and uh, help the local um, uh, survey groups and so forth to, to understand what's there. One of the best ones I think is iNaturalist. It's an, uh, many of you probably may know this, but iNaturalist is an application that you can get on your phone and you take a picture of an insect and then you upload it. And um, that helps not only identify the organism, but it also helps you helps the database. Um, it, it adds more data to the database. So scientists use this information now to figure out what is happening to these insects as the climate changes and, and everything's happening. So it's a very important activity to do actually. And even with moths, you know, bugs at your porch light, take a picture and upload it to Agri Naturalist. You'll learn a lot because they'll help you identify, but also you'll help the scientists that need that information. Um, and then, so sort of continuation of the same concept is share what you know with kids and the public. Um, talk to kids, talk, you know, little bits of information, anything about a bug is interesting to kids. There's sign, you know, there's lots of, not lots of, but there, there's been um, some studies that have shown that kids between the ages of six and 12 are the most receptive towards the natural world. And if, if that really is the case, um, this is the, the window of time we need to be um, presenting this kind of information to them. And they're just interested. The problem is that we often tame, oftentimes uh, kind of brainwash their minds, making them think that they're all gross when they're, when they're not. So in our um, lab, we have a project called Frass in the Class, where we go to classrooms in Florida and we um, show kids uh, insects and how fascinating they are. And uh, we've been focusing actually on the Luna moth. This is my daughter on the right, actually, and she loves Luna moths. Uh, there's caterpillars all over the house now in cages. Everyone, every caterpillar has its own name. 
um, and, and so forth. And I think that we can always, you know, we should promote this stuff and doing this with not just butterflies. Butterflies, oftentimes I think in the insect world are kind of treated separately from the rest of the bugs. So if you use something like a large moth, it actually can help change that perception, the negative perception of insects. And in Japan, the negative perception of insects is changed by beetles. I mentioned beetles sold in department stores at the very beginning of this talk, but that's how, you know, the kids look at, uh, butterflies and, and other insects and beetles and things like that as you know they're all just all insects and there's even um in japan there's even a bug hotel uh where you can go to and the owner is an entomologist and uh and there's actually uh the, a bug light on the side of the hotel. All the people that go there are entomologists, kids and their parents come together and they look at bugs during the summertime. It's always booked. Um, it's amazing. There, I wrote an article about this because I just found it so fascinating. Um, but you can go there and you just you just learn a lot about bugs. And, and the food, there's bug food. Um, there's a, a, a garden in the back that, that's like all the plants and stuff are grown um, from, from local uh, plants and, and insects and so forth. Um, and also uh, number eight, this is the last one, is getting involved in local politics and supporting science. Um, there are uh, Janet Fraser and, and Andrew Weaver are examples of uh, now politicians that were scientists before. So we can um, not only, you know, um, kind of advocate for science or advocate for uh, insect conservation, but we can actually become politicians if you really wanted to, to go to that level and make changes um, at, that, at that level, both at kind of local levels, and, but even more, more higher up as well, which I think is very important. So this is the kind of the, the summary slide about what I just talked about. There are eight action items here, five in the create insect friendly habitats category and three in the insect increase awareness and appreciation of insects category. And all these are important. And um, this is all found in the paper. And I'll show you the a link to the paper at the very end so you can find out more if you're interested. Um, finally, I just wanted to say that, so I just mentioned my daughter and um, a few slides ago, uh, but this um, past year, um, my daughter wanted to give me something and, and uh, this is a way to uh, help conservation. Um, but for Christmas, she wanted to give me something and she, um, instead of getting a gift, like we, we have too many gifts, right? Like I feel like kids are just getting too many uh, materialistic objects. So we decided, uh, my, my daughter's mom decided um, that instead of giving away gifts uh, of presents, um, in the sort of traditional sense, we're going to do something a little bit different this year. This is last year, but my dad, uh, my, my daughter wrote this, um, and this card, it says, Merry Christmas, Dada, she calls me Dada, um, Xerxes Society. So this is a Xerxes Society type of talk, so I just wanted to throw this in there because I find this really interesting. But the gift to me for last Christmas was a Xerxes Society donation. And so what, what happens was she, she made a donation to the Xerxes Society and when you make a donation, you get a small gift. The small gift was a pollinator habitat sign, which I love and I have it in my house. So I got the pollinator habitat sign. Xerxes Society got its donation and everyone's happy. And then we got rid of the materialistic aspect of Christmas, right? I'm not saying that that's bad, but we tried to reduce it a little bit. And um, if you're interested in, you know, there's all these kind of creative ways. And I think this is a really great way to help conservation, to, to give gifts to um, to, to make a donation to a uh, conservation organization as a Christmas gift, it's just an idea. Um, and this is the, the this is the last slide, uh, but this is just a, a summary of what I talked about. Um, and uh, the, this is the paper, and you can find everything uh, in here uh, in this paper. And the the barcode is here too, so you can if you take a screenshot of this, you can just um, link it to your phone and you can see this this study. So all the details about the specific eight action items are found in here. Sorry, I went pretty fast. Um, I think we have some time. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I've worked for Xerxes for going on five years now, and I still learn so much each week. So I get, I love getting to host these webinars. Um, and yeah, and I just want to say we'll include um, the links of the things you mentioned in the YouTube video as well. So those will be in the description there. So if in a few weeks, anybody wants to try to track those down, that's a good place to find that. Um, and we've got one question in the queue here, so we'll get going there. And if you all have any additional questions, we do have a good 20 minutes of time that we can use here. So please feel free to submit those. Um, the first question here, Akito was talking about the types of soap 
cleaning cars. Um, do you have some recommendations for what would be non-toxic in the water runoff? Yes. So there's actually um, we included a bunch um, in the in the study. So if you look at the paper, um, there there's specific links and stuff in there um, that I would would advise to to take a look at. But there's a bunch of them out there now, and more and more companies are becoming aware of this problem. So I, I highly recommend that. Nice, excellent. All right, um, another question here has to do with roadways. So we know that planting pollinator habitat near roadways is one um, strategy, especially at Xerxes here. And the question is, are those insect populations at risk by those plantings being near roadways? Sorry, the, the plantings being close to roadways? By a roadway, does, is that a risk for um, so roadways, so it's great to be planting and making um, roadway areas, uh, you know, um, with lots of flowers and, and things like this. And um, it's, it's important to make those habitat usable. Um, I guess one thing, I wouldn't say that the, it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing to do that. Um, it's definitely more helpful to create more habitats than not. In Europe, for example, there are you know lots of um, areas that are typically kind of mowed down. They've converted them to just natural flowering um, fields, and and I think this is really amazing. Um, where where they have even small pieces of land, and you know they've looked at the cities have looked at their their um, the way uh, their, their parks are are designed and things like that, and they're trying to remove some of these sort of uh, vacant areas and they're, they're filling them with with plants and, and other organisms or, or, or plants and other um, natural habitats. Um, I think around um, highways and things, um, there is the always the issue of of cars going by and, and um, there's a lot of road noise and things like that. So uh, nocturnal insects that have hearing organs, for example, might be impacted by them because they are very sensitive to those those things. But it's better than not having that habitat and just having, you know, a mowed down lawn-like uh, area. So I would say definitely it's very good and we should do whatever we can to increase these types of natural habitats and remove some of the artificial habitats that we have created just because we think they're, they're pretty. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, a question here, you talked a bit about light pollution. Um, this question is, are lights that come off and on based on movement any better or worse than regular house lights that are just you know on when you turn them on and off? So movement of light is not as important as the wavelength of light and the intensity of light. So the problem is, um, the, the biggest problem is, you, you know, like these stadium lights, for example, uh, they're, they're very high intensity um, lights that, that oftentimes are in, you know, go in their mercury vapor lamps or sometimes, you know, metal halide or um, high pressure sodium lights and things like that. And they produce ultraviolet light. And ultraviolet light range is the problem. The insects are attracted to those lights. Movement of you know regular incandescent light bulb, you know, kind of moving around or something. Sure, it's not great, but it's not as bad as those types of lights. So you want to just get away from the ultraviolet light range. So every light bulb, or you, you can find out what the wavelength of light is from your uh, light, and that is where you want to avoid UV and try to go into more of the red yellow range, and that's or just, you know, you try to dim your lights or direct them away from the forest. You know, you don't want to have a light shining right at the forest because it's going to attract lots of things. Excellent. Um, okay, another one here. Is the extreme weather uh, impacting insects? In Texas, we had a record breaking freeze in February that killed lots of plants. I also wonder about the high temps that we are seeing in Portland, Oregon, yeah. which is 104 today. I'm sorry, 104 is very hot. I thought Florida was hot. It's not that hot here. It's like 90 and, and I'm, I'm complaining, but um, yeah, it's it's very hot. It's getting hotter. There's no question about it. Um, there's uh, some record highs recently um, in, in uh, Siberia where it was over hundred degrees. It's never been over hundred degrees in Siberia, like almost ever. And so, so these kinds of things are obviously happening and uh, the high temperatures are problematic. Yes, it's actually one of the possible biggest causes of the insect declines. I didn't really talk about some of the major drivers, but um, obviously there's things like pesticides, herbicides, and things like this that are affecting um, insect declines. But one of the biggest drivers that we think that's very hard to kind of um, uh, calculate is, is global temperature change. But we know for a fact that, you know, um, butterflies and other insects that are found on high mountaintops are disappearing. 
And there's been, uh, because the, you know, ice is melting and there just isn't, there isn't water and things like that in places like mountaintops anymore. Um, and so when you think about what's happening now, this is, this is a very critically important time to, to really, we, we really got to do something. I mean, it's not, it's not a situation where we can just sort of let it go because these things, you know, with the temperature changes, things are disappearing fast. And so, yes, global temperature change is a huge problem. It's probably the biggest one, actually. And related to that, since this talk is about that kind of the action items, and this is a very broad question, but if you have any suggestions or just like in your field of study, are there things we should also do to help insects adapt to the stresses of climate change? So is there any other? Mm, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, uh, I mean, I think, you know, there are certainly insects that are beneficial immediately to the to humankind, like you know honeybees, for example. And so, um, trying to help those insects do you know adapt right is is very important. Um, there's just too many. In, in some ways, there's a lot of insects out there, and it's really difficult to try to help save all of them kind of, you know, I think, I think the best approach in this kind of situation is habitat conservation, right? We try to conserve the habitat in the best way we can. Global temperature change, I mean, we have to, we have to do something about that. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the estimates for the upcoming years that was put out a couple uh, days ago last week um, is, you know, it's, it's very scary. What, what we're what we might be encountering if we continue with the way we're going with things so i think it's something we all need to really be thinking about and i guess one thing i would like to just also add is like you know the global temperature change thing is is an impacting um uh uh plants and, and when they flower right in the springtime and that's shifting significantly and what happens is when when um you know, plants start to come out sooner than than insects or vice versa, you have this disjunct, disjointed situation where the pollinators cannot, or, or the, the, the insects can't find their hosts because there are no hosts at that point in time, uh, perhaps, or the, the, the flowers bloom, but there are no insects to pollinate. And so this sort of thing is, you, we actually see this kind of thing happening now. And uh, this is a big problem. And this is where the citizen science or the community science efforts that I mentioned, like iNaturalist really is important. Because if you can document, if you take a picture with your phone and you're outside, you take pictures of bees or whatever flies, it doesn't really matter. Like if you take the pictures, because when those pictures are taken, we can actually use that information and figure out, okay, March 17th, this, this bug was here in Florida and the temperature was so-and-so. And we can start to create these graphs of where are the insects and how is that changing over time? And we actually really need that information as scientists to kind of get an estimate of how much is actually shifting. We know it's shifting, but we don't exactly, we don't have enough data points for lots of insects because there's just so many species out there. So everybody can help. And, and I really strongly advocate for um, taking pictures and posting them uh, through iNaturalist. It's a very important uh, activity to do. Excellent, thank you. Um, back to pesticides and herbicides here, there's a question that notes that in the invasive species management world, pesticide and herbicide use is often necessary. How can we better manage invasive species while keeping non-target species like pollinators in mind? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think we need to figure out ways that are more specifically targeted towards those uh, insects. We have to, um, with those pests, we have to move away from general um, pesticides that are applied sort of broadly to to protect particular plants right so we need to i mean there's obviously problems with ipm or integrated pest management but we can find ways where we um where we have uh predators uh that are potentially more more specifically targeted and more more research really needs to go into this and unfortunately we oftentimes with you know approaches like ipm we oftentimes um release uh predators too soon without really fully understanding what could potentially happen. And so the research really needs to be uh, further um, developed. The problem is there's so many introduced species oftentimes that um, it becomes harder and harder to kind of take control of everything. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, that's not a super positive answer, but I do think that additional research and funding uh, to to mitigate these problems is really important. And uh, fortunately, there's more funding now for science. 
Excellent. Um, and we've got a question here that asks, what are good resources for the other scales of action? Um, so at the regional and city level. And I wanted to just, if I could plug for a moment, we do have a program at Circe's called Be City and Be Campus USA. And that's either um, at a citywide level or on a university campus where um, a group put to, puts together a resolution that's based on providing habitat and mitigating the use of pesticides and herbicides. And that is adopted by either the, the governing body of that city or the campus. Um, so that is one way to get involved on that level. And the website is bcityusa.org. Um, and you can also find that on a link to that on the Xerces website. And then Akito, if you have anything to add to that, thanks for letting me do the, the Xerces plug there. Yeah, sure, of course, no problem. Um, I would say, you know, getting involved in, in local um, politics and, and local, um, uh, you know, um, activities to, to promote these, these actions are really important. I think we need to work as, as a group. Um, the problem is, you know, it's sort of a bottom up situation, I think, right? Like we can try to make changes at the, at the biggest scale, you know, at the you know, national or global scale, but as a single human being, it's very difficult to do that. So um, I, you know, what I'm suggesting is we as a group need to need to push this from the bottom up to local um, uh, government officials and so forth. And that needs to get sort of translated up the ladder. And the more push that we do, the more they will respond. And I think that is where we all need to start. So we all need to have um, better um, sort of synthesis among, among people to, to come up with concrete plans locally. Like, you know, we wanna change this in this, this place because we know that, you know, these lawns are no good or this, you know, uh, roadside habitats need to be changed in this area and so forth and really push that um, as a group. And I think that's the way where you can actually start to make change. And if we start to do that together, we will start to see the changes. And I, I, have, I really advocate the lawn thing. I mean, the, the converting your lawn to a natural habitat is a very, very simple action that everybody can do if you have a lawn. And, you know, it's, it's, you just don't mow it. It's like you, you actually don't have to pay for it either. You don't do anything, you just let it go. And that action is actually surprisingly beneficial if we all do it together. So those are the kinds of actions that we want the global, you know, like the, the national larger scale efforts to take place, the policies to change and so forth. But we also can do things immediately uh, today um, and at the sort of the very local backyard level that I think is also incredibly important that will help the insects immediately. Excellent, thanks. Um, and so in talking about creating habitat, you know, we're always plugging um, the use of native plants. Um, and at Xerces, we've, we've recently been um, putting a lot of effort into uh, sourcing and making sure that those nurseries aren't using insecticides that are especially harmful to insects, such as neonicotinoids. Um, and so this person's question is, they have done um, the Xerces program where you reach out to your nursery um, and ask them what they're using and give them some resources on how to move away from that. Um, but they are wondering, they said they would love to see all plants labeled with pesticides where they're used at nurseries and things like that. Um, and is there a way to get growers to change their growing practices? Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, I can put a link into that website, um, our website on buying bee safe plants. Um, but I was just wondering if you had any recommendations for how at that, you know, above the personal level at like a retail level, how we can help drive that change. Yeah, I think I think that the change needs to happen. Um, we need to have information about what is actually being used in, in lots of, um, things that are sold at you know at the nursery level and and upwards um and sort of having better standardizations of or standardized measures of um, information flow about what is actually um, in these products and how are they being used and the impacts that they can have on the the environment is is critical and i think um there also needs to be more more research right so i mean as a scientist i i, I continue to sort of say this but but i really feel that oftentimes we just as scientists we're always trying to write grants and trying to get funding to to study this stuff we we want to learn you know we want to know more about the impacts of neonics on on insects but we can't do the research because we simply don't have the money to do it right so we can't even hire people to do these kinds of things so um so there's a there's also these kinds of problems sort of at the at the higher level uh, in which there needs to be I think governmental sort of push to really say okay yes these are really important things that we need to understand in terms of what kind of chemicals are going into these products and you know uh, and and their impact on the the 
then the environment and on humans needs to be better understood. But we just don't really have, um, oftentimes, we still don't have enough, I think, in terms of um, the knowledge that is necessary. And once we have the knowledge, it will become even more easier and clearer to put that information on these products. Excellent. Um, and so you, you mentioned, you know, the importance of phonology in your talk. And so we have a question here. Um, how do we help educate people on the close connection between native flora and native insects? Can you point us to resources that identify which species require which and how they fit into the local ecosystem? That's a great question. Um, I, I would say I, I like to talk about particular examples. I think um, every kind of um, wherever you live in the world, um, there are different examples. But here in the United States, one of the kind of the, the, the ones, you know, one of the ones that I love to talk about is the yucca moth, yucca plant um, situation, right? So the yucca moth is a moth that pollinates the yucca plant and the plant needs the yucca moth to, to survive. And the, the moth actually does the pollination and then it lays an egg inside the flower. And that is how the caterpillar grows and, and requires the pollination to happen. So the moth can't survive without the plant and the plant can't survive without the, the uh, without the moth and vice versa. And so, so that, those are kind of, that's just one example, but there are examples like that all over the place. And um, when you think of those kinds of interactions um, and, and then you think about kind of the potential shifts that happen when rainfall changes or temperature changes and, or, or you know, light pollution is introduced. I mean, these are the things that, that you know, we know, you know, like, you know, these, these moths are attracted to lights and what actually happens to those um, situations when, when those artificial, um, uh, drivers are brought into the picture. Uh, that's, I think, where where we really need to kind of yeah uh, focus on and trying to figure out what's what would actually potentially happen. But as examples, I mean, the one that pops into mind is that that example. But there's many other ones out there. The yucca moth, yucca plant one is a great one for the Western United States because they're they're there in the in California, uh, Oregon, uh, Arizona, etc. Yeah, and I and I put a link into our um, pollinator resource center and you can find our different regional plant lists um, and in there we include a couple of species for each um, season so that you've got you know bloom and resources throughout the season and that's a really good entry point for talking to someone about the importance of that native flora and providing those resources um, year round. Um, and we've got a, a shout out here from our executive director, Scott Black, who, um, as Akito mentioned, was an author on those studies. Um, and he wanted to note that Xerces focuses on nature-based climate solutions, which help species adapt to the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, and especially in the pollinator program, you know, we do a lot of habitat restoration. So we're working on understanding which species are successful in these clim changing climates. Um, so here on the West Coast, where we do a lot of work in the agricultural industry, you know, we're dealing with these extreme temperatures and we wanna make sure that we're putting in habitat that is resilient to those changes. Um, and if you have anything to, more to note on um, climate change, Aikido, um, unless any more questions come in, we'll be wrapping up here. Sounds good. All right. Um, yeah, so we don't have any more questions. So any closing remarks or thoughts before we um, finish? Well, I would just say, you know, um, yeah, the world is changing and lots of things are happening, but let's keep going out there and, and looking at the organisms. They're, they're amazing. The insects are incredible. And, um, and please keep teaching children like kids need to see this and kids, unfortunately, Many of them are spending too much, in my opinion, um, a lot of time indoors, and we don't actually take them outside enough. And um, it, that's very important um, when you think about the future and the environment and um, yeah, future of Earth. Thanks. Thank you.